Welcome back to RevSec 2022. You are welcome to send any technical questions to the host through the chat panel located at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to submit a question, please do so in the Q&A panel. Closed captioning is available. This session is being recorded. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another session of RevPsych. I'm Srija. I use she, her pronouns, and uh, I'm a fourth year medical student at Yale. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce our next session. Uh, we have closed captioning available for those of you at home. Select the live transcript or CC button and select show, uh, show subtitles to see closed captioning. If you have any other access needs, please let me know. Our, this session will be split into two separate presentations. So I'm very excited to introduce our first speaker, Simone Drew. Simone Drew is a, currently a first year medical student at Columbia University Vagilis College of Physicians and Surgeons. She graduated from Harvard College in 2020 with a bachelor's degree in history and science, focusing on medicine and society, receiving magna cum laude with highest honors. She completed her senior th thesis on the history of black psychiatrists, anti-racism activism efforts in the 1960s and 70s, for which she received the departmental thesis award in her graduating class. She then spent the next two years working in healthcare consulting before matriculating to medical school. She's very interested in pursuing a career in psychiatry, as well as the intersection of mental health, health disparities, and social justice. With that, I'm excited to let her take the stage to give her presentation, Speaking for Ourselves, Black Psychiatrists' Activism Against Racism from Integration to Black Power. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. Let me go and uh, share my screen quickly. Um, are you able to, to see that? Okay, great. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'll be talking to you about the history of Black psychiatrists' anti-racism advocacy efforts in the US between the 1950s and 1970s, uh, tracing their work through the civil rights and Black power eras and especially how they started organizing both within and outside the profession um, and how they drove the dialogue around uh, racism's impact on mental health during that time period. Um, I also want to uh, preface with the limits of this research uh, that it's primarily historical given that it was for my undergraduate uh, senior thesis in the history of science department and that it's also focused more on black psychiatrist perspective who's obviously a professional group uh, rather than patients' experiences. So this was partially a product of whose historical voices uh, were more easily accessible. Um, so I just wanna start by saying there's also many, there's many questions that this specific research didn't answer, um, but are very much worth asking. And so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here with you all today, considering that um, I submitted this uh, research right before the pandemic started in March of 2020. Um, so I'm really excited uh, to be able to engage with it again. So uh, to begin the story, uh, in 1969, a group of Black psychiatrists came together to protest the American Psychiatric Association during their annual meeting in Miami, Florida. And they demanded that the APA make more efforts to increase Black leadership within organized psychiatry, um, specifically the APA and the NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health, and pay more attention to the mental health issues of Black communities, um, particularly racism, since psychiatry often neglected them. And so this was an unprecedented, um, heavily politicized moment for, the field, for that um, field of medicine, um, which is highlighted in this newspaper article headline uh, shown here from the Psychiatric News, um, the news journal of the APA. And it, made, it even made the headline of a New York Times article as well. So it was clearly a moment that uh, garnered people's attention. And so having learned about this uh, protest in one of my uh, history of psychiatry classes, I found that there wasn't an extensive amount written on it um, and um, why or how it happened. And so I wanted my research to sort of build out from this moment, asking how and why uh, Black psychiatrists became involved in um, anti-racism advocacy um, in the first place in their field. Um, so my primary uh, question was how and why did Black psychiatrists um, activism against racism um, evolve and strengthen over time, specifically between uh, the 1950s and 1970s, and how do they get to this, to this particular point? 
And so Black Psychiatrists Anti-Racism Advocacy in Medicine um, didn't start in 1969 or even in the late 60s. Uh, rather, they'd been combating racism within the psychiatry for decades, and the ways in which they did it sort of reflected the overall goals of Black political activism um, in the particular whatever time period uh, they were working in. And so I divided uh, the research sort of into three chapters, um, three chronological chapters, um, each dedicated to a specific decade. So the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s. And unsurprisingly, I found that Black psychiatrist activism seemed to sort of move with the tide of Black political protests more broadly in the US um, from integration efforts during the civil rights movement in the 50s um, and early 60s uh, to dismantling white power structures in, in during the Black power movement um, in the late 60s and uh, early 70s. And so to, to, to start with the 1950s um, and sort of characterize this era, I, was, I, use, I wanted to use a specific uh, research paper as a sort of case study for the ways in which um, Black psychiatrists sort of engaged with discussions of race um, in their field during that time. And so in 1951, there were these two um, American psychiatrists from Columbia, um, Abram Cardner and Lionel Obsey, um, who published this study called The Mark of Oppression, a psychosocial study of the American Negro. And so the cover of which I've shown um, on the left here. And so since after World War II, there was an increased interest in studying the psychological impact of fascism and racism. And with the mark of oppression, they aim to understand how Black people's low social status, particularly re uh, referred to as caste um, in their paper, impacted their personality. Um, the book claimed to be empirical and not just theoretical or speculative, saying themselves that our data derive um, from the examination of, quote unquote, a new source material, namely the Negro himself. Um, and so it's worth noting also that both of these uh, psychiatrists are um, white men. And so they studied 25 African-Americans in Harlem from both um, lower class socioeconomic status and middle and upper class socioeconomic status as their experimental group. And then they compared it to their, quote unquote, their control group, uh, the quote unquote, American white man. And so to summarize what their research was about, they basically said that the lower class Negro personality was characterized by psychological, uh, by maladaptive uh, psychological methods for dealing with difficult life circumstances. Um, they said that they displayed um, increased quote, increased suspicion, mistrust, aggression, and denial. And then on the other hand, they depicted middle and upper class Black people or Black Americans as having personalities that were a caricature of corresponding white personality um, characterized by deep self-hatred and, and a sense of betrayal towards other African-Americans. So to sum all these very traits is what the authors call the mark of oppression. And they said that be this cause of the so-called mark of oppression was the history of slavery concluding that the only way to end these psychological impairments of Black people was to end um, racial oppression. And so in response, um, some Black psychiatrists and other mental health professionals published pretty opinionated reviews of the study in the National Medical Association Journal. Um, for context, um, the National Medical Association of the NMA was established in 1895 when Black physicians um, weren't allowed to enter um, the AMA. So it's, one of, it's the leading um, organization for uh, Black physicians at that time. And so first in March of 1952, a Black psychotherapist at Lafarge Clinic in Harlem wrote a scathing review of the mark of oppression um, in that journal where he called the book a cruel and monumental fraud not doing right by the Black patients that they deem to help. And so that very negative review triggered a discussion of the mark of oppression among several Black psychiatrists within the NMA, um, which is, and the title of which is shown here on this slide, published in 1952. And some of the um, Black psychiatrists who contributed to this review are, are named here. And so they unanimously criticized the methodological flaws of the study, but they also sort of started to delve deeper into what it meant to study the psychology of Black people. And so Dr. Stevens criticized the, the claim that there even needed to be some sort of scientific objectivity when discussing the intersection of race um, or discussing medicine and the intersection um, with socially sensitive topics like race. And so he said that Collins paper raised a question in my mind concerning the effectiveness of attempting to objectively counteract the damage that arises from this book. And so, but rather than 
um, stopping this type of research entirely, they sort of advocated for more sensitivity and better methodology for psychiatry's research into race and the Black community, given that Black people often weren't even the focus of psychiatry research in the first place. At the same time, though, during this era, Black psychiatrists were largely not the ones publishing research papers on racism in their journal. So this discussion was a bit of an anomaly during that time period. Um, because Black psychiatrists had to struggle for acceptance into the field of psychiatry in the first place, um, combined with the fact that there were so few of them in this white dominated field, their voices in the 50s are ostensibly like missing from this, um, from this, from this literature. And so in addition to having to combat the racism from their, their colleagues, um, Jim Crow also had concrete impacts on their ability to even practice medicine from having restricted professional privileges to having segregated hospitals for their, to care for their patients. So in the 50s, their activism was more directed towards gaining professional visibility for themselves and then also fighting against segregation to better serve uh, their patients. But one anecdote worth mentioning, though, is that there was one Black psychiatrist named Dr. Charles Prudhomme who looked more outward from the medical field and tried to get the APA to advocate for desegregation during the Brown v. Board um, trial. However, the APA heavily discouraged him from doing that. And he says himself that he was advised by the APA to withdraw from the involvement in the case and remain aloof from that political issue. And one, um, and he says, one eminent leader described my proposal as simply an additional example of my continuing acting out. So the political discussions that they were having um, during this time period were, were pretty limited for, for a variety of factors, of, right, of reasons. And so by the early 60s, uh, Black psychiatrists had begun to make, take a more publicly dominant role in studying racism than they had in the previous decade. Um, in conjunction with also the increasing momentum of the civil rights movement. And so the movement obviously helped with the passage of a bunch of legislation that helped, that protected um, Black physicians, patients, and communities against segregation in healthcare settings, um, such as um, within the Civil Rights Act itself, um, it being illegal for hospitals to receive federal funding if they do um, practice uh, segregation. And so some psychiatrists got involved in the civil rights movement before their careers even started. Um, for example, uh, Dr. Gl Gloria Johnson Powell, um, who would become a renowned uh, black woman child psychiatrist became involved during her time at Meharry Medical School, um, participating in sit-ins and um, leaving Meharry to join the Freedom Rides temporarily. And then other politically involved psychiatrists joined the Medical Committee for Human Rights in 1964 uh, the group of healthcare professionals who came together to provide uh, medical care for civil rights workers in Mississippi. Um, one of the best uh, known, one of the most famous psychiatrists in this movement was Dr. Alvin Poussin, who would eventually um, become nationally known for his writings on civil rights um, and the Black experience in both psychiatric journals and in popular uh, Black magazines such as Ebony and Jet. And so in contrast to the situation in the 50s, Black psychiatrists were now more publicly and vigorously contributing to this uh, body of literature that had initially, that they initially weren't really able to, to drive, um, that was driven more by uh, white psychiatrists and social scientists like Gardner and Obsey. And in fact, Black psychiatrists were now the ones um, sort of dominating this literature. And so up to and including like 19, around 1966, um, most Black psychiatrist publications about race focused on explaining the psychological damage that resulted from segregation, namely ultimately arguing that integration was a sort of like mental health necessity. Um, for example, in 1964, Dr. Charles Kinderhues um, published a paper in the NMA journal that studied the negative effects of segregation, particularly on the education of Black children. And so Black psychiatrists were now also using their professional expertise to bring psychiatry's attention to the civil rights movement, also as a way to justify the actions of the, of the movement's participants, because there were obviously um, people who were trying to sort of pathologize um, the civil rights movement as well. So they used mental health principles to explicitly defend that the, the sound mental health of protesters, implying that it was the social system that was the problem. Um, so Dr. Pinder Hughes also published another paper um, called Pathogenic Social Structure, a prime target for preventative um, psychiatric um, intervention. So where he sort of um, talks about um, this exact 
um, issue. And so Black psychiatrists were now sort of um, leading this, uh, this literature here. And so pictured in this, um, on this slide, um, is an advertisement from uh, Dr. Jean Spurlock, who engaged directly with the general public by giving them a series of by giving a series of lectures to uh, parents in Evanston, Illinois public schools to help uh, parents and children sort of um, get on board with the social changes that integration was coming with. Um, so this is all to say that during this time period, Black psychiatrist advocacy efforts were largely centered around integration, um, still very much informed by the optimism of the integration um, political agenda of the civil rights movement. And so in the mid to late 60s, the civil rights movement is sort of beginning to fragment, largely due to the fact that race relations were still not getting better. Um, as we all know, school segregation efforts often resulted in violent and angry retaliation from white parents and students, and race riots were a huge problem in this in cities. And so even um, in, 19, in his 1968 address to the American Psychological Association, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. described this worsening or seemingly worsening uh, racial atmosphere is saying that the decade of 1955 to 1965 like, misled us as in they didn't really foresee how much violence um, would, would come from this. And so as racial unrest began to boil over in American cities, um, nonviolent protest was no longer obviously seen as enough to combat how deeply entrenched white racism um, was um, and is. And so as a result of these inadequacies, there was this new movement, um, the Black Power Movement. And so in 1967, uh, Stokely Carmichael, lady, later known as Kwame Ture, and Charles Hamilton defi officially defined um, Black power in their book, um, which is uh, pictured on the, on the left here. So it's, a, this, it's this new political slogan and ideology that highlighted the importance of consolidating leadership capabilities of Black people. Um, serving as a call for Black people to define their own goals, to lead their own organizations and support those organizations. And not only that, but they also coined the term institutional racism, which is obviously what we're very much familiar with, but at the time um, was a very new concept that deeply influenced um, Black psychiatrists' efforts um, in organizing in the mid to late 60s. So as opposed to individual racism, obviously they defined institutional racism as the le legally sanctioned systems that kept um, black people in substandard impoverished conditions and healthcare is not excluded from that. And so as a result, um, this sort of new or this sort of evolving socio-political context of the black power movement and this new concept or this nascent concept of institutional racism really impacted um, the sort of change in the direction of um, what sort of Black psychiatrists were research, researching and discussing. And so as the Black power movement gained um, popularity and then you continue to have all these frustrations um, boiling over in cities, um, you can sort of, Black psychiatrists began to embrace this emerging do-it-yourself political framework by directing their energies towards organizing amongst themselves, um, coming together to use their position as Black mental health professionals to improve um, race relations in the country. And so at the 1966 um, NMA annual meeting in Chicago, um, one of the Black psychiatrists named Dr. Charles Wilkinson sort of wanted to test, uh, assess to see how interested other NMA psychiatrists would be in forming a study group to discuss um, racial issues, um, now believing that they needed to organize um, more rigorously. And so at the end of the NMA uh, annual, con the next annual NMA conference, there was even more interest. And so Wilkinson took the lead in sort of creating this um, study group of this organization um, within of black psychiatrists who were really interested in addressing um, these issues. And so they began to try to advocate for more black leadership in the NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health, um, which they said itself was infected with institutional racism. And they felt that the NIMH had the largest influence on the lives of everyday Black Americans rather than just other me Black medical professionals. And so their focus on the NIMH was in part a function of the movement's prioritization of building new institutions and getting and obtaining power for themselves to bring back uh, to, to, to their communities. And so 
by the late 60s, their publications also began to circle back to discuss some of the racial research that was done in the 50s and early 60s, including um, what I discussed earlier, uh, the mark of oppression. But now it's being read in a much different um, light. So rather than just being um, or grateful that Black issues were being addressed at all, the turning tide of Black activism towards institution level racism now enabled NMA psychiatrists to ask larger questions about the authority of psychiatry, psychiatric researchers themselves. Um, in a review of the current um, literature on uh, Black mental health, um, another Black psychiatrist, Dr. Alice Guglietti, writes, the experts on the Negro are almost exclusively non-Negro. The Negro, therefore, must often learns who he is, not through self-discovery, but through an outside source um, whose perceptions may be distorted and or naive. And so she was but one example of the NMA uh, psychiatrist sort of using this so being empowered by the self-determination um, framework and trying to apply it to uh, mental health uh, research. And towards the, the end of 1967, the NIMH did give a small grant to uh, Dr. Wilkinson, who was trying to start this new uh, study group in, of Black psychiatrists in 1966 to fund the group's meetings as they tried to um, sort of address racial tensions. And their first meeting took place in February 1968, and their second meeting um, took place in April, early April 1968. And so sadly, but almost serendipitously, um, Dr. King had been assassinated on the night where they were meeting. And so they were watching all of these riots break out across the country as they were trying to figure out how to um, improve the rate, improve um, to help Black people and improve race relations in this country as psychiatrists. And so the organizing spirit, as I've sort of been describing, was already present in this group for a few years. But many of the April, the people or the psychiatrists who attended that meeting in April remember Dr. King's assassination um, as sort of this catalyst um, for really trying to uh, bring, um, bring action and bring change. And so uh, Dr. Uh, James Comer, who I personally interviewed for this project, um, I was asking him about this and he remembered it as sort of this moment of reckoning with the fact that uh, mental health needs of uh, Black communities across the country were not being met, um, not by the civil rights movement and not by psychiatry. And so he sort of says that there's this, this anger in the streets that made us realize that they weren't addressing uh, mental health issues um, as much as they should be. And they felt that psychiatry was not addressing racism um, and that they needed to be more inclusive and they didn't necessarily expect um, psychiatry as a whole to be more exclusive so they wanted to, or inclusive so they wanted to take take action um, so this excerpt that I put on the slide here is directly taken from that from the statement that the group wrote on April 5th where they say to steal the white man's property is to hit him where it hurts and so the sardonic laughter of the looter um, but to burn and destroy are the kinds of release of rage and frustration of people who don't know where to turn and so you can see also on the bottom here, it's a little bit um, harder to see, um, but that there's the names of the black psychiatrists who were involved in this group, who, who signed uh, the statement and who were, who were there during that, during that moment. And so in the month after uh, Dr. King's assassination, the study group of black psychiatrists was asked to present um, at a session of the APA annual meeting entitled uh, Black Power, um, an Identity Crisis. So this was the first time where the Black Psychiatrist Study Group explicitly was able to like associate, associate itself um, with the Black Power Movement. And so pictured here are some images that were, some pictures that were taken um, at the meeting, um, which I found uh, from the APA's archives in Washington, DC. Um, so it was here where the group was able to openly criticize the NIMH for support it for not being um, not doing enough to address its own um, institutional racism and not addressing uh, the needs of the country. And so this meeting also inspired more black psychiatrists to get in contact with one another. Um, so going from left to right here, you can see uh, Dr. Charles Wilkinson, the, the founder of this um, or the person who initiated the study group. 
um, Dr. Alvin Poussin, who was um, a, one of the most famous uh, or most nationally known Black psychiatrists um, who wrote a lot of uh, very public articles um, in Ebony and Jet, sort of trying to um, talk about the mental Black mental health um, in a more public forum. And then also um, Dr. Chester Pierce um, on the right, who is very, who's most well known for uh, coining the term uh, microaggressions um, later on. And so uh, one of the most powerful or impactful papers during this time that was presented uh, was presented by uh, Dr. Charles Pinder Hughes, who spoke about um, the Black Power movement. And instead of sort of advocating as much for integration as much as they were talking about earlier, um, they're talking about now how integration could only occur if um, white people began to understand um, how the ways in which Black people had been historically um, psychologically undermined um, and socially undermined. And he described the Black power movement as a sort of collective psychosocial treatment for the country, saying that if there were enough influential whites who were able to participate constructively in an alliance with the Black Power Movement, then you can develop more trust and positive bonds and cooperation to sort of make a peer relationship between Black and white people possible for the first time is what he says. And so now we're seeing Black psychiatrists very vocally and unequivocally supporting and defending um, the Black Power Movement um, in front of their, um, with their colleagues. And so this brings us back to uh, where we sort of started this story um, in May 1969. So after an amicable but not very successful meeting with the NIMH director in April of 1969, the group decided that they needed to formally confront um, the, the APA and the quote unquote white psychiatric establishment. And so they planned to officially protest the APA annual meeting in Miami the next month. And so they they tried to circulate information about this uh, protest to uh, Black psychiatrists across the country. And so on the evening of May 5th, 1969, um, the, the group in Miami held a meeting uh, for an election for what they termed to be the Black Caucus, the newly coined term for their study group. Um, in its executive committee was then entrusted to compile the caucus's list of demands for the APA. And so while the trustees were having breakfast on, in the morning, the caucus presented their, their 10 demands to the APA. And so these demands included having a task force for the APA to determine how it could better serve the Black community, increasing leadership positions for Black psychiatrists within the APA, putting them in charge of research programs, um, increasing Black leadership and funding of Black community programs within the NIMH, um, et cetera. And so their feelings are sort of encapsulated in this uh, quote below where they say, to date, the APA has not adequately addressed itself to the burning issues of our times. Historically, Black psychiatrists have been excluded from positions of influence and authority. And in addition, the APA has been irrelevant to the needs, social and psychological of uh, Black people, including its own members. And so during the course of these deliberations, the caucus also formed this entirely new organization um, called the Black Psychiatrists of America. And while they would still remain under the APA um, through the Black Caucus, they also wanted to have their own um, organization to be able to um, advocate for the causes that they, that they deemed important without um, necessarily having the, uh, the uh, limitations of being um, associated only with the APA. And so now um, there's this question of, okay, there was this protest and now we have this new organization. And so what happened next? And so in the early 1970s, um, immediately after this protest, there was an increase in the number of, there was an increase in the number of black psychiatrists and APA committees. Um, and beyond that, they also took more leadership roles in other psychiatry organizations. Um, Dr. Chester Pierce, who I mentioned earlier, was the first um, president of the of the BPA. Um, and so at the same time, not all of their original demands were met, um, largely due to the fact that some members of leadership of the APA were also afraid of this organization of the organization becoming too political. Um, and so there was still, but also the group was very much still resisting um, this tradition of Putting white, psych putting white psychiatrists in the role of the black expert as they, as they call it. And their criticisms of 
um, white driven psychiatric research drove them to create um, new research institutions um, outside the APA that were both run by black psychiatrists and specifically designed to study mental health issues within black communities. Um, one of which was the Center of Minority Mental Health at the NIMH uh, championed by Dr. James Comer who's pictured on the left here. And then also the Solomon Fuller Institute um, the founding president being Dr. Robert Sharpley. And this picture on the right here was just um, and it, what uh, the check that I found um, in one of the archives um, in DC, the APA archives of the, uh, that was able to um, assist in the founding of, of this institute. And so they were both dedicated to addressing the public mental health problem of racism, um, developing minority mental health programs and recruiting minority staff members uh, to the NIMH. And this wasn't just limited to, to Black people, but to other minority uh, groups as well. And so the 70s also came with um, an explosion of publications by Black psychiatrists that more openly reevaluated the ways in which racism had impacted psychiatry, um, continuing the trajectory that had been set um, by certain uh, publications in the late 60s. Uh, so psychiatry articles in the NMA journal reflected Black psychiatrists reinterpreting um, the the meaning of blackness in their own medical field. And so they no longer focused on civil rights and as much in the emotional damage of segregation, but now they were sort of talking about what it meant to be black and practice psychiatry or what it meant to, uh, to treat black patients. And so some, some black psychiatrists also attempted to um, refute some of the old psychiatric paradigms in order to reinterpret and normalize um, black people's behavior in a way that would have previ that would have previously been considered pathogenic. So, for example, uh, Dr. Jean Spurlock, um, a well-known uh, black uh, woman phys uh, psychiatrist who I mentioned earlier, um, dedicated herself to emphasizing the strengths of black families that had previously been considered uh, pathological. So, instead of focusing on dysfunctional families, sort of emphasizing that um, matriarchal families have um, positive aspects and not just not focusing on negative aspects. And so the mental health of black children was also a particularly strong area of focus for many black child for many black child psychiatrists within and outside of the APA. And as for some of the specific projects, um, one of the BPA's original areas of interest was mass media, um, since uh, Dr. Chester Pierce felt that it was one of the great purveyors of uh, microaggressions. And so the, the BPA film project was dedicated to teaching children how to recognize and, and deal with microaggressions. And uh, he took, Dr. Pierce took part in planning sessions for, um, the Ses for Sesame Street for the children's uh, television workshop, um, serving as a member on its national advisory board with Sesame Street sort of being this um, intervention to sort of show black children um, or showing black people and of, and white people and people of all races sort of interacting together in a positive way. So they felt that the media could have a really strong um, impact on um, improving uh, race relations. And so some black psychiatrists focused their efforts also on developing uh, black leadership outside of organized psychiatry and more towards the practice of community psychiatry. Um, since community mental health centers were increasingly um, in areas with high uh, urban poverty. And so one of one of those psychiatrists is pictured here, Dr. June Jackson Christmas um, on the bottom here, um, who founded the Harlem Rehabilitation Center, um, which was this uh, innovative community-based uh, psychiatric program, um, which trained local Harlem residents, not just physicians, to assist um, psychiatric patients with um, getting back into society. So the point of this is just to say that there were many ways in which uh, Black psychiatrists tried to uh, implement um, this uh, Black power vision uh, throughout the 70s. And so this picture was taken at the uh, APA Nash annual meeting in 1978, and it captured uh, the members of the APA uh, Black Caucus um, and the uh, BPA, since many were members in, in both organizations and were also in the NMA. So although uh, Black psychiatrists had been present in the organization for decades at this point and had been present in the NMA for even longer, this is the first and largest documented group picture that they had all taken together. And so it showcased the powerful and vocal uh, presence that Black psychiatrists were creating for themselves 
both within pre-existing organizations as well as their new um, black run organizations. And so whether they were working together to reformulate mental health research and psych psychiatry organizations or separately for addressing the needs of black children and black communities, they all had the, the common political goal of reconstructing the profession so that it was better served by and for uh, black people in the US. And so this is just a quote um, from Dr. James Comer sort of describing um, why, describing the importance of having uh, the BPA saying there was, it was the, the difference was this knowledge base, um, people who were positioned to do something about it um, and sort of being able to put pressure on, on psychiatry in a way that wouldn't have necessarily um, happened otherwise. And so the, the, logo, the logo also of the BPA is, is on the bottom right here. And so although the, the specific social movements uh, mentioned here have, have ended, uh, racism is far from over, obviously, both in the medical field of psychiatry and in society more broadly. Um, pictured here on the left um, is, this, uh, is this publication that was written in 2018, uh, Black Mental Health Patients, Providers, and Systems, which examined the, the current state of Black mental health and mental health care. And there, some of the uh, psychiatrists who I mentioned earlier were interviewed for a chapter of this book where they also, where they all sort of agree um, that they would like to see, um, uh, again, Black psychiatrists continuing to come together to create um, institutional uh, change in the field. And although they'd made very notable progress, several of the institutional changes made in the 70s no longer exist today, um, such as some of those uh, research organizations. Um, it was also just a bit serendipitous that while I was working um, on this research, um, Dr. Alpha Stewart, uh, the first uh, Black and Black woman psychiatrist or president of the APA, um, had just been elected. So I was also able to speak to her about what the what the BPA meant to her, which I've I've highlighted here. And so also I I finished this this project in February 2020, immediately before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So obviously before there was even more, there were even more discussions of people, the general public being forced to realize or reconcile with the inequities embedded in healthcare in our criminal justice system, as well as the disproportionate mental health toll of all of it on uh, black and brown communities. Um, but I think that the lessons um, is still remain the same um, and are even, are just further emphasized in that um, just, Trying, what I tried to show by the story here is that um, dismantling racism in the field of psychiatry specifically, um, and also in general, is inextricably tied to large scale social movements and social change. And it sort of happens in, in stages, um, but, the, but the work obviously is, is yet to, to be complete. So that's, that's all I have for you today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Simone, for a wonderful talk. There was a round of applause, but I didn't unmute in time. Um, we have time for maybe one question from the audience in person or virtual. Hi, Simone. Thank you so much for a really important kind of historical piece of the puzzle. Um, this is Tony Hatch. I was just spoke earlier, and I, I'm really interested in the role that these Black psychiatrists played. But my question is about their training. Where did they go to medical school? And what were psychiatric training programs like in HBCU medical schools like Meharry, Howard, and those that were the only places where Black physicians could get trained outside of a few select elite institutions that would let a few Negroes in every now and again? Mm -hmm. No, that was definitely a question that I didn't necessarily get to fully delve into with this project, but was something that definitely I wanted to, would, could be a spinoff of this project of taking a step back, like how did these black psychiatrists even get to where they were in the first place. And I did find that a lot of them um, were trained um, in HBCUs, um, but some of them um, were a bit more spread out. I know that I think Dr. Chester Pierce might've gone to 
um, Harvard for medical school. So it's it's not necessarily um, everyone went to the same the same schools, um, but I think um, also their experiences uh, changed over the course of of the time periods that I was talking about as well. In that, in the even before the '60s, it's hard to sort of know um, what their experiences were like. But I know I was able to track um, what Dr. Ernest Williams was sort of saying about his um, experience training at Howard and sort of saying how colorism playing a huge role and who could even become a physician in the first place. Um, and just talking about how, I know Dr. Alvin Poussin sort of mentioned um, his experiences of racism um, in his training and um, patients not even wanting to, to speak with him. So I think something that it's not necessarily a question that I could answer fully with this research, but I think that it was, that's a question that I also had after finishing this, because I know that I was sort of only able to access the voices who were the people who were more vocal and the people who had been able to obviously get through psychiatry training. Um, and so I don't necessarily think there's as much um, in, or there's not as much being said of that before piece. Um, and also I know um, one anecdote I remember uh, re during my research was um, this psychiatrist talking about his experience at this conference um, in the 50, the psychiatry conference and sort of saying how his, um, some of the, uh, one of the white, one of his white colleagues at the conference explicitly saying how he didn't think that um, black people were fit to become a psychiatrist. So I think there's little snippets I've heard here and there about um, the, the training and what that was like and where they were, um, but I don't have a complete uh, piece of, of that story. So I think that that's the, the, the training is another uh, uh, area that I think is worth uh, researching because I didn't, there's not that much that I've found um, in this uh, historical area. So sorry that I don't have a more uh, thorough answer to your question, but I think it's definitely um, something that I also wondered. So if you could please give another round of applause for Simone's wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, it was great to be here. Thank you, Simone. So next, we've got our next session and it's titled Psychiatry's Carceral Imaginaries, Lessons from Science and Technology Studies. And our presenters are Andy Wen and Taiwo Ilongye. Uh, just as a heads up, we may run five or 10-ish minutes uh, after a 4.45 finish. So with that, uh, please give a warm welcome to the both of them. Hi, everybody. Can everybody see that okay? Is it showing us the slide or the presenter mode? I think I think we were good there. How about now. Great. Okay. All right. Um, thanks for being patient with that. Yeah, our, our talk is titled uh, "Carceral Imaginaries in Psychiatry: Insights from Science and Technology Studies," and we'll get started. Um, hoping to not go too much over time because we want this to be generative and to have a, a great discussion at the end. Um, but we'll just start with some positionality. Um, this was modeled for us by uh, an upper year resident um, at, at Yale Psychiatry, um, AZA. Um, so wherever you are, AZA, thanks for modeling this for us. Um, uh, but I'll go ahead and start. My name is Andy Wen, uh, he, him pronouns. Uh, I am of uh, Chinese heritage on my father's side, who's an immigrant from Northeast China. My family is a part of the Hui minority and on my mother's side, uh, white American uh, from uh, Washington state. And uh, I grew up in uh, occupied Duwamish territories, uh, also known as Seattle. Um, did all of my kind of undergrad and graduate training there. And then now I'm a PGY2 psychiatry resident here at Yale. Um, and yeah, turn it over to Taiwo. 
What's up, y'all? My name is Kaiwo Longe. I use he, him pronouns. I am a Nigerian American, um, uh, descendant of Yoruba people. Um, I grew up in Miami, Florida, or Seminole land, um, and here at, in New Haven um, at Yale, a second year resident with Andy. Um, so a quick overview of, of our talk today. We're going to talk a little bit about why STS, you know, why are we looking for insights here? Um, uh, a few definitions to get some shared language. Um, go over um, kind of our, our primary paper that has led to a lot of, um, uh, you know, framing of how we're thinking about uh, the approach to, to what we do every day. Um, uh, by Ruha Benjamin and kind of thinking about her definition of carceral imaginaries and her and some of her guiding questions. We're going to look at some examples of, of work within STS, um, the, the scholarship at the intersection of psychiatry and carceral imaginaries, and, and work on some uh, and work on identifying technologies. And then uh, we'll return to Benjamin's paper and her call for an abolitionist consciousness and how to conceptualize efforts to exert um, freedom and agency with and against sciences and technologies, and, and hopefully get some good discussion going. So real quick with some definitions. So why, why science and technology studies was also called science, technology, and society studies. Um, I think, you know, in our formal medical training, you know, through medical school and, and in uh, residency as well, we don't uh, interface with the humanities as, as much as I think that we, we should. And um, uh, I also just have a huge crush on people who do this, this type of work. Um, it's, it's exciting to be able to, to see a field that is really taking a magnifying lens and putting up against you know, what we do day to day um, here as, as, as physicians, as psychiatrists. Um, and so some of the things that, that we can use this lens to look at is, is what is a technology? Is any object or tool or infrastructures or policies um, or documents, um, anything that, that is part of the way we go about our business? Um, and we can kind of think about these objects in, in, in a little bit more detail and be more intentional about uh, how we use them and why we use them and things like that. Um, it's a, a big part of it is the process of making the invisible visible. Um, and then kind of, you know, we, we talk, we throw the word carceral around a lot. I think it, the, the big thing is for me is that it's the kind of antonym to, to liberatory. Um, anything from, you know, you know, like objective prisons and, and the infrastructure of, of containing humans to, you know, kind of surveillance state stuff or anything that is, uh, you know, anti-liberatory. Um, and then uh, Benjamin's paper talks about incorporating critical race theory into what we do, um, which is kind of a hot topic in the last, you know, half decade or so. Um, but, uh, you know, kind of the, there, there are several tenets of crit critical race theory. Um, I think one of the, the most important ones to just bring up to not uh, go too much into this is, is the ordinariness of racism as one of the central tenets is that racism is is ever present in, in all of uh, these facets of life and society. Um, and uh, in Delgado and Stefan Chit's 2001 book about critical race theory, they actually use the words normal science um, as a part of uh, their definition of the ordinariness of racism. And then one of our papers really touches on uh, neoliberalism. Um, so I wanted to just define that quickly as a as kind of a, a political philosophy that um, really decenters uh, public goods and, and uh, shifts the economy and, and social life into a model of privatization, um, you know, sort of defunding you know public health, defunding public education, working on privatizing things to maximize profits for for private individuals. And then finally, abolitionist consciousness is, is kind of um, both a, a abolition as well as a building of, of liberatory ways of being. Um, Taiwa, I wasn't sure if you wanted to, to add anything to this definitions page. Nothing much. I mean, I think kind of, again, thinking about neoliberalism as a, and kind of trying to connect these off to psychiatry, thinking about how in a lot of ways the work that we do kind of extends a lot of what we see carcerally thinking about the work we do, how it um, like portends to neoliberalism in terms of our work being driven by markets and economies and, you know, thinking about um, abolitionist consciousness and how in a lot of what we want to do for our patients 
thinking about how we might want to dismantle systems that prevent us from providing the care they need, particularly for minoritized individuals. Um, so starting with, with our first paper that, that really frames the rest of the talk, um, it's called Catching Our Breath, um, Critical Race, STS, and the Carceral Imagination by Ruha Benjamin. Um, what this paper really does is it examines um, carceral systems at this intersection of critical race theory and science and technology studies. And it's, it's written as um, not just a... a a series of case examples of, of how these fields intersect, but a, a call to scholars within the field of STS to kind of bring critical race theory and um, a lens uh, as a lens and to kind of train uh, people's scholarly attention on to um, how technologies become uh, or exhibit carceral logics. Um, and so again, I, I mentioned um, kind of critical race theory, mentioning racism as ordinary and, and normal science. Um, you know, how do we um, kind of denormalize or uh, think about how racism is so is so normalized in our everyday practices? Kind of making um, what is often invisible to a lot of people practicing the science more visible. Um, and uh, another big um, thing that Benjamin brings up is, is um, she has a whole book on, on race as technology, um, which uh, ultimately creates these parallel universes and, and premature death. Um, and, and just examples that she provides of how race um, like that uh, as technology or technologies that kind of re reify race, you know, for example, um, things that require maintenance and upgrade over time. So homemade nooses are upgraded to state issued firearms and violent voter intimidation is upgraded uh, to voter ID laws and lawful redlining becomes uh, predatory lending later. And so these are kind of the guiding questions that Benjamin places in her paper, which I think are, are, really, in point, are really poignant questions to think about. Um, both for scholars looking at, at science and technology studies, but for us to think about as we you know, move forward in our careers in psychiatry, as psychiatrists, as people who do science and carry out science and apply science. Um, but she says that in, in moving forward, several features of carceral imagine, imaginaries are worth highlighting as a basis for ongoing research. This conceptual lens is not only applicable to those processes that are directly tied to prisons and police. Rather, I propose an expansive understanding of containment that trains scholarly attention to the underside of techno-scientific development. Who and what are fixed in place, classified, corralled, and or coerced to enable innovation? And she says that a critical race STS agenda builds upon feminist, post-colonial, and critical disability approaches, which in turn would benefit from greater consideration of how carceral imaginaries seek to contain individual bodies and collective visions of the future. And so now yeah, I'll let that sit for a second. So kind of with those questions in mind, you know, we started our, our, our literature, literature search and, and just brought up a few examples of papers um, that kind of fit within these frameworks and, and kind of intersect with psychiatry. Um, and then Paiwo, I know you wanted to kind of build off of this a little bit. Yeah, I'll build up a, a little bit towards the end after we discuss the papers. Okay, sounds good. Um, so now our question is, how does psychiatry hold people captive in its practice and its techno-scientific development? And we'll look at some examples of that. Our first paper, um, Neurobiologically Poor, Brain Phenotypes, Inequality, and Biosocial Determinism by Victoria Pitts taylor um, This paper actually directly references um, uh, Benjamin's paper and, and uses Benjamin's kind of outlined framework and questions to, to go about her research. Um, and what she researches and her object or the technology that she's looking at, um, she looks at 21 different studies on the neuroscience of poverty and neuroplasticity and um, proposed interventions for, um, uh, for the problem of poverty's impact on the brain. 
Um, and so kind of what she finds in her arguments is that these papers ultimately share a neurocentric logic, prioritizing brain-based explanations for behavior. And a lot of them really rely on correlational evidence and exhibit biosocial determinism. Um, you know, what that means, for example, is um, like one paper had, uh, they, they looked at brainwave activity among, you know, only like 28 to 30 um, young children who had varying um, socioeconomic status. Um, and, and these different, they found differences in brainwave activity um, and then uh, used that as evidence of uh, poverty's impact on the brain, um, but then didn't actually correlate that to any sort of, you know, performance metrics or anything like that on uh, whether or not these variances in uh, brainwave activity were actually consequential for um, kind of uh, often ableist definitions of, of uh, kind of a properly working um, neurocircuitry, I guess. Um, so that's one example. Um, and then kind of for the, the topic of biosocial determinism, the idea of um, that biology uh, causes social problems, even while admitting that um, social problems impact people's biology. Um, so that's an example of fixing people into place or fixing them as impoverished or fixing poverty in the brain. Um, the other thing she notes is that this research is largely colorblind and um, there's no consideration of the racialization of poverty, but um, they still use racialized language in their writing, in their papers. Um, they'll use word, uh, they used phrases like the other side of the tracks or the inner city or the local crack house. So the, the takeaway kind of is that this, um, the neural phenotype of poverty is fixing and reifying vulnerable subjects and it's suitable for correction, which enables techno-scientific interventions converging with neoliberal and carceral modes of governance. And what that means is the neoliberalism kind of trying to create products for purchase. Um, the, the neoliberal approach to solving the impact of poverty on the brain is to you know, create drugs that address the, the problem or to create certain therapies uh, that, in, that kind of reverse the impact of poverty on the brain rather than uh, any sort of social or public um, investment in uh, addressing poverty itself. Next, our next paper is How Personality Became Treatable, The Mutual Constitution of Clinical Knowledge and Mental Health Law by Martin Pickersgill. Um, in this paper, the objects and technology are, are different that um, Pickersgill um, studies are articles, editorials, correspondence on personality disorders, policy documents, interviews, and seminars. And I think the main technology here is diagnosis and policy. So overall, his aim in this paper was to show how mental health policy and mental health practice mutually constitute one another and that the aims of clinicians and policymakers are largely aligned. And the thing that is of note here too is that personality disorders kind of prior to the Mental Health Act of 18, 18, I mean, 1983, were deemed usually untreatable. Um, and they were typically people who clinicians felt were burdensome to the system or that they were not able to be treated um, through psychiatric or psychological means. So with the installment of this act in, in 1983, we saw a shift occur um, where there was a shaping of policy and then clinical practice so now for someone to be involuntarily hospitalized, they needed to be just, they needed to have treatment um, that, or they needed to be able to justify that they could be treated. And before this act, um, people could be involuntarily hospitalized or they were put in carceral institutions. And now with this act, it kind of changed the frame in which we related to people who had personality disorders, namely psychopathic or antisocial personality disorders. So when we saw this act passed, there was a lot of movement and activism from clinicians to now destigmatize personality disorders so that they can then treat and get people treated. Um, again, the people who are fixed here are the people who have who've been diagnosed with psychopathology, who then are now more difficult to capture or corral. So with the changing of this law here, um, now that it makes it a little bit difficult for people to be brought into mental health institutions. And therefore, work is done to kind of catch up clinical practice so that they can then capture these individuals. 
And then over time, we saw that occur um, in 1980 when the DSM-3 dropped in the United States. Um, people in Britain really liked, liked the nuance that was delivered to personality disorders. It was the first time that a major section in the DSM-5 or the DSM-3 was attributed to personality disorders so that then can, that can then kind of erase some of the vagueness. We started seeing antisocial personality use more in the UK as opposed to psychopath, psychopath, psychopathy. And then we also started seeing treatment modalities being used. Um, I think the thing to note here is that there weren't a lot of new treatments that were used. There was a lot of existing um, therapeutic interventions and some um, ph pharmaceutical interventions as well, kind of again, showing you that with the change um, in technology, there was an adjustment in society, whereas the people fixed were, again, the people who were diagnosed here. And the consequence and the takeaway from this is, the, again, the impetus of protecting the public from, through carceral logics, change the diagnostic classification of fixed and plastic. Again, um, the idea that um, personality disorders are not treatable is now changed to something that is treatable. There's still stigma around them, but now there's a treatment that can then um, lead to people being put in these systems. And then the, the techno-scientific development provided avenues for the state to corral people into involuntary treatment. Um, one thing to note is after this act was passed, there was a person who was treated and released and then they ended up killing two individuals and that led to um, dangerous and severe personality disorder being developed. Again, this was not a clinical diagnosis, but more administrative. Again, another way to capture people who were not able to be treated Eventually, there were several acts that were passed, namely in 2006, which then changed the treatable, the treatability to appropriate treatment. So now people could be treated um, based on whether they had appropriate treatments available as opposed to if a disease or disorder was treatable or not. I think the other, the last thing to note here, this article is the one article that we have that doesn't specifically talk about race. Um, and, you know, I don't, I'm not as familiar with the, the UK literature on mental health as a place to race, but we could obviously think of connections here in the United States. The presentation given before by Simone talked a lot about the civil rights era and talked about um, how you know there was DS, DSM diag DSM criteria to think about paranoia um, and how that usually led to the um, kind of stigmatization and pathologizing of Black people. Um, and you can probably make, you know, extrapolations about what that might look like. Um, you could probably make assumptions about who is being captured, who is being corralled in the UK, um, which which identities are being are facing these systems. Our next paper is called Suspect Technologies: Scrutinizing the Intersection of Science, Technology. Um, and policy by Nancy Campbell. It's an earlier paper in 2005. Um, this is one of the papers that has kind of like one of the most clear cut examples of, of a technology. And, and she analyzes the history of development um, of two, two different types of drug testing technologies, notably sweat patches and hair, to hair analysis, which she kind of defines as uh, su suspect technologies. Um, and, you know, kind of she, she brings these technologies up as examples of things that are ultimately used to reinforce exclusion and incarceration, uh, revoke participatory citizenship, and determine who qualifies for social services. Um, and the impetus um, kind of in this um, uh, development of these technologies is, is kind of to ultimately assess risk um, and kind of uh, define like a new era of security through evaluating like who fits in this um, kind of bucket of people who are, are risky. Um, and uh, notably that these the development of these technologies in the first place actually really relied on car carceral systems. Um, they were first tested on people uh, on probation. And then uh, what was really important for the companies developing these tests was to get judicial acceptance of drug test results as admissible evidence. Um, because if they were able to do that, then they could widely um, distribute these as, as viable means of um, kind, of, kind of fixing people as positive or negative on their tests and then having kind of judicial responses to the results of the test. Um, 
and you, you kind of see it's not directly named uh, in, in this paper, but the neoliberal impetus of creating a technology and then marketing it and then kind of having the incentive for it to be um, well utilized. And some of the paper goes into how it wasn't just in these carceral systems that they tried to start to kind of push this technology. They also were trying to go into HR departments um, and, and hiring departments to you know, say that, you know, we can use this as a more reliable way than kind of a more um, than urine testing, which is kind of at risk for being tampered with um, and kind of marketing the benefits of sweat patches and hair analysis. Um, and then uh, kind of that the main takeaways from this is that, you know, the technologies we use have already leveraged those in captivity for their development. Um, and this reproduces um, a further incarceration and social stratification. Um, and these technologies play a role in subject formation, um, which is kind of you know, creating people who are positive for a test. And then that leads to kind of their subjugation as people who live in a parallel universe where they are um, either kind of forced from probation back into incarceration or have their children removed from them or they don't qualify for social services or things like that. And then one of the final um, kind of uh, takeaways that, that Nancy Campbell advocated for with this paper is to kind of apply the strict scrutiny policy for the development of technologies. And she talks about how with these, with social sciences, oftentimes by the time uh, a technology is investigated by a sociologist or a STS scholar, like there's all these case studies of how a significant amount of harm has been done retrospectively. And kind of thinking about strict scrutiny, is, it's a legal term of, you know, is this law going to negatively impact the people that it is intended to, to govern? Um, and, uh, there's an advocacy from Nancy Campbell that we need to be applying that from the beginning of techno scientific development before people are harmed or before people are kind of disproportionately experiencing um, uh, anything that is, is harmful for them. Then the last paper we'll discuss is the suspended is on the suspended sentences sentences of the Scott sisters, mass incarceration, kidney donation, and the biopoliticals of biopolitical politics of race in the United States by Ann Pollock. And in this study, the object and technology is a case study exemplifying routine structural violence and mass incarceration and the embodiment, the embodiment, embodiment of biopolitical citizenship. So in this particular case, it's the case of two women, sisters, um, Jamie and Gladys, who were arrested and given dual life sentences um, after being involved in a robbery, which amounted in $11. Um, there were three men involved in the robbery who spent only three less than three years in prison, but um, Jamie and Scott ended up having life sentences and ended up staying 16 years in prison. Um, during that time, Jamie gets really sick, um, requiring a, any, ending up with end-stage renal disease um, and requiring a kidney transplant. Um, and her sister was willing to donate her kid, one of her kidneys to take care of her. Um, in this context, though, the kind of medical and clinical tools needed to do these things are not available in prison. So they were requesting pardon of their pardoning of their sentences so they can be able to, so she can receive this life-saving care. Um, a lot of advocacy was going around this that, you know, Jamie's sentence went from life to life sentence to a death sentence due to kind of the mismanagement of her health at this time. So through this, the governor of Mississippi at the time, Haley Barber, suspended the sentences of Jamie and Gladys on the condition that Gladys donated her kidney to Jamie. Um, and the process of subject formation is a creating a biopolitical citizenship, again, using the medical condition to now create a citizenship for um, both these patients, both, both of these people. Um, if Jamie gives up her kidney, she now has one less kidney um, and is undergoing surgery, which creates disability in Gladys, obviously. Um, now having a new kidney being immunosuppressed and having to be on immunosuppressants indefinitely. Um, and the life sentences fixed identities as criminals forever. Um, and the felons will not, the felonies will not be unpardoned. So the denial, so thus leading to the denial of their full citizenship, which 
that prevents them from voting, prevents them from getting jobs. They're required to pay an administration parole $52 a month. Um, and I think the thing to note here is, again, thinking about the identities of the women being Black and women and how those are fixed. Um, there's a quote from Gladys that she notes that when she was a little girl, or from Jamie, when she notes when she was a little girl, her grandmother used to tell her that slavery was not dead in the South. It's called the law now. Again, thinking about you know, the captivity and the capture of Black people and Black women as a technology that is updated through slavery, Jim Crow, and mass incarceration, and how both Jamie and Gladys's case um, speak to that. Um, and the last thing to note as well is with respect to the suspending of the case, again, you see how the state um, responds to Black women and, and Black people in general. Again, the suspension of the case by the governor was largely on the impotent, based on the impotence of the care of Jamie becoming too expensive for the state. Um, caring for her and getting dialysis at, you know, as needed um, would require about $200,000 a year. And because of this, this actually benefited the state to have her suspended from, have her sentence suspended for, so they don't have to pay for this. And then the other note was that there was note that uh, both the sisters would be moving to Florida, which again would take the cost of their medical care because they would be using Medicaid out of the state's hand again. So again, thinking about um, you know, the black bodies that are kind of subjects to the state um, and seen essentially as pieces of labor as well as um, kind of an item of um, expenses. And when, the, when, when keeping them captive became too expensive for the state, that's when their sentences were able, able to be suspended. So the consequences and takeaways here are carceral systems of captivity, not only organized bodies and space, but also generate, generates parallel universe, universes that constitute and deprive citizenship and generate premature disability and death. And then returning to Benjamin. So Benjamin asked us of two things, to keep in mind institutional practices that seek to limit the freedoms of dispossessed groups well beyond the prison walls, and also propose we consider how abolition is constant consciousness is, um, is a way of conceptualizing efforts to exercise freedom and agency with and against sciences and technologies. And as that relates to psychiatry, um, obviously, there's a lot of technologies that we engage with every single day, whether it's our diagnostic tools, whether it's our ability to involuntarily admit people, whether it is our ability to give people medications over objections through legal means or restrain or give people medications, again, you know, intramuscularly. Um, thinking again about, you know, what institutional practices do we face on a daily basis in our clinical scope um, that are continuing to oppress people, again, outside of prisons, um, you know, the carceral log logic certainly exists within our practice. And then thinking about abolitionist consciousness was, again, kind of thinking about how we can resist these systems and begin to dismantle them. Um, so with that, I want to leave you all with some space to kind of discuss or think about thoughts as it relates to things that we discussed or um, thinking about kind of these carceral logics in psychiatry in general and technologies. We could give a warm round of applause for Andy and Taiwo. And we can now take maybe one or two questions. Both, feel free, both folks in person and online. Is it possible to, to see all the participants and panelists on the, you know, either in person or, or online? Uh, there's some faces we'd love to see. Fortunately, I'm not sure we're set up to do that. Hold on, we've got a one in-person question. Give me a moment. the people online will be able to hear it, no worries. Hi, sorry you can't see me. Um, thank you so much for this um, compelling overview of really important SDS uh, work. Um, my name is Rosa Munson-Blatt and I'm at the nursing school, but in a previous life, I had studied STS actually under Victoria Pitts-Taylor. Um, love that you shout out. Yeah, she's awesome, she's great. 
Um, and now I'm um, in nursing and in healthcare. And I think something I have struggled with is integrating um, what I learned that was so important in STS and applying that as a healthcare practitioner now, um, especially in our uh, complicated landscape that is our current healthcare system. And so I'm curious um, how you guys, having studied STS, are now navigating applying that in your practices. Thanks. I mean, when I when I first kind of like talked about this, some of this talk was based off of the conversations that I had in a in a science and technology seminar, and uh, one of the people in the seminar asked me why I was even looking at this stuff. Like, what is it going to do for me as a as a practicing psychiatrist? And I think it like in the practice of making the invisible visible, like I think about that a lot. And I think about what we can brainstorm as our, you know, kind of treatment modalities, one of like, um, like how treatment modalities are developed and how we can kind of talk about them with our colleagues of, you know, are our antidepressants, um, you know, how are they exerting neoliberal logics of, of kind of maintaining, like fixing people as depressed in order to continue selling antidepressants? And what are, how do we kind of incorporate all of these other holistic modalities of treating depression into our treatment plans and care with our patients in order to like not, you know, kind of prescribe a pill and then leave the, the pill to do its work so that we can kind of rack up money through our kind of med management visits is kind of one way I'm conceptualizing this, but also kind of in advocacy through talking to our colleagues about how they're doing their science or how, how they are like kind of reproducing carceral logics in what they focus their attentions on in their research is, is just something I think about. Yeah, you know, I'd briefly, um, STS is relatively new to me. Um, shout out to Andy for putting me on game, but I think a lot of its principles are things that I've thought about for a really, really long time. Um, kind of, again, thinking about making the invisible visible, um, you know, thinking about like how our practice and the way we think about and organize people into a way where we might disorder someone and then that then plays into treating and then what that treatment means. Um, rather than thinking about why the bigger question of like why someone presents the way they do and what can we do to address like that why rather than the individual person. Um, so I think, you know, how to do that within our scope of practice is pretty difficult because our scope of practice in and of itself is, is kind of a structure in the Benjamin paper she talks about, you know, you can lack kind of racial animus or be, you know, to racially tolerant or even be someone who, you know, kind of goes against some um, racism. But if the machine is created and you're kind of clocking and clocking out, the machine's going to do what it does. So it's again, thinking about how to operate outside of that machine, um, whether that's through advocacy, whether that's, again, thinking about what material needs people might need um, and how to get it to them. Um, and, you know, using our position as, you know, respected people in society um, to try to, you know, bring resources to people who might not have them. Uh, with that, I think we're going to conclude the session. If we could give one more round of applause. So thank you everyone for joining. We're gonna have a break till uh, 5 p.m. So the next nine minutes or so where we're gonna have uh, some closing remarks. Uh, so stay tuned. Thank you everyone.
Hello, everyone. Okay. We are ready to get our uh, closing remarks started. Uh, so thank you all for your patience today, both online and in person. We greatly appreciate it. Um, we're really excited that all of you and your participation is what made RebPsych hybrid a success and for making the RebPsych community so rich and vibrant. We want to thank all the members of the RebPsych organizing committee uh, for all their hard work in producing today's event. In particular, me and Tara Anderson, Marco Ramos, Abby Equeme, Barbara Trejo Ortega, Terrence Embry, Terrell Holloway, Taiwo Olongye, Upper Ajitha Kaple, and Olivera Uradu, as well as our faculty advisors, Bob Rohrbaugh, Rina Kapoor, and Maya Prabhu. A special thank you to our remarkable presenters who have shared their talents and creativity from across the country with us today. And a special thank you to all the community organizers, activists, and members who constantly challenge dated modes of care for both and for both reimagining and creating peer-led non-carceral forms of care. Hey everyone. Um, it has been incredible to hear all the presenters today. This work is so important and I wanna bring it back to history a little bit because Europe's campaign of slavery and colonization was not only about the seizure of land and the mass murder of people, it was also a global epistemic massacre, the seizure and erasure of knowledge, many different types of knowledge, but also knowledge about ourselves, our inner lives, and eradication and replacement of pre-colonial ways of understanding ourselves, our minds, and our relationships to each other. Colonial regimes then created social and intrapsychic operating environments, as our keynote speaker mentioned earlier today, for technologies of race, white supremacy, and control. Um, and one of these operating environments is actually the discipline of Euro-American psychiatry. And therefore the work that you are all doing, the work that we're trying to do at Reb Psych is nothing less than exposing and dismantling these technologies and operating systems in our minds, our bodies, and, how the, and as they operate in psychiatry and all of the fields that intersect with it. Many of the presentations today along that vein are about rebellion and riot, people standing up to the police, the prison state, their professions, diagnoses, and the cages of our own colonized psyches. Some of our presenters are fighting to pry the fingers of the surveillance state out of mental health and medicine so that it cannot be weaponized against the people who need these services the most. Others are literally liberating substance use treatment from hospitals and bringing it into the communities. So we hope that you are feeling inspired, hopeful, resolute, and angry because as much as this conference is about producing and sharing knowledge, it is also about a call to action. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate the thanks to everyone. There was a little literal fire alarm in this room and still we persevered. Was that sabotage? <laughs> I don't know, but um, yeah, thank y'all all for being so patient today. I really appreciate it. And building on what Neantar was saying, I think it's also important to acknowledge the fact that the sort of carceral um, systems that are built into psychiatry that we've been talking about today that were featured in uh, Professor Hatch's keynote um, are not just out there uh, somewhere in society to be fought against. They're literally here in this institution and propagated in various ways. There's many examples, one of them is the, in the Connecticut Mental Health Center. They are currently discussing and will likely implement TSA style uh, uh, scanners and metal detectors that community members will have to walk through to get the health and healing that they desire. And these surveillance technologies are being implemented in Connecticut Mental Health Center, which tends to serve a population um, that mostly uses state-based insurance. Um, whereas if you go to get mental health care at a place like Yale University, that tends to serve people who have private insurance, you're not forced to undergo these, these surveillance technologies. So this is relevant for specifically where we're sitting today. And I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, building on what Nian Tara was saying is this, this conference as a platform for calls to action. Um, I just wanted to lift up a couple of the calls to action that I heard at the various panels. Um, one was from the New York Lawyers for Public Interest. It's doing incredible work 
at the inter intersection of immigration detention and using medicine as a way to get people out of untenable detention sites. Um, please follow up with them. And we're gonna, there's gonna be a follow-up email. So we're gonna plug these various interventions in the email. Okay, great. Um, we're gonna plug these various interventions in the email. So if you wanna follow up with these organizations, wanna engage in their work, you can. Um, in the panel I was just on, I just wanted to pass on a phrase that was said there. Uh, it is uh, one of uh, the community organizers on the panel, Allah said be anarchical doctors, which I think is something that I will, I will like hold uh, with me. Um, Project Let's encouraged us to examine where our learning from, comes from, specifically what history of harm is implicated in the knowledge that we use as clinicians and practitioners. Um, and uh, finally, across a variety of panels that I witnessed, there were these pushes as Srija was saying, for peer respite um, uh, oriented programs as opposed to these again dated carceral systems. And I'm going to let me and Tara want to add. And one more call to action is for Justice LA, um, just helping to fight the carceral system that's basically taking over LA County. And so we'll include this information in the um, follow up email, but there's a phone number that you can text. I'll read it out so it's in the transcript. Um, it's 2136. 463, so it's 213-463-6287, and just text help justice to that number and you can get involved in their efforts. Amazing. Okay, so thank you all uh, again for coming. As I said, this is, I hope, the beginning of a conversation and not the end of one. Um, so we will be emailing presenters and attendees all of these calls to action, as well as a feedback form. We'd love to hear how this went for you um, as, as, as part of the people who attended or presented at the conference. Um, you can always reach us at rebpsych at yale.edu. And we would really love for more people to get involved in this, particularly at other institutions, wherever you're coming from. So if you would like to get involved in the organizing of this, um, please reach out to us at that email address. And we're gonna reach out to you, as I just said. Um, again, thank you everybody for coming. I really appreciate it.